called on politics. But suddenly, she suffered a debilitating stroke and a brain tumor that left her temporarily blind. It was a heavy blow to the entire family, but more so to her father, Raila, who had just lost his eldest son, Fidel, and was, on the other hand, engaged in a bruising battle royale for the presidency in 2017. Three years later, Rosemary is as bright-eyed as ever. She allowed our cameras into her home to speak exclusively to Punchline on her politics, dynasties, and the road to recovery. That interview, after the break. Welcome, Rosemary, to Punchline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on Punchline. Thank you, and, and thanks for the opportunity and for hosting us in your home. Karibu. Asante. So, um, I guess I just want to start by asking, how are you doing? How are you coping? I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. Everything. I think I'm doing much, much better now. Thank you yeah. for asking. You certainly do look it. Um, tell us about when you discovered something was not quite right in your health and your journey since? Well, I was on a working holiday with my kids. Mm -hmm. um, I was working, mm -hmm. they were on holiday. <laughs> As, isn't it always with moms? <laughs> Everyone's on holiday, you're working. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I was working uh, at a training for uh, leaders, uh, women leaders, mm -hmm. and I could feel my head was aching. and. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, their kids had gone out for dinner. In the morning, there was a knock on the door. And um, so when I opened the door, I collapsed on the lady who was um, coming to get me ready. Mm. And um, she walked me back to the room, mm. put me on the bed, lay me on the bed. And um, then uh, my youngest uh, daughter ran off to the reception, tell them there's something wrong with my mom. Mm. And uh, when they came with an ambulance, they took me to the clinic that was nearby. Mm -hmm. And when the doctor at the clinic saw me, he said, no, mm -hmm. there is something not right here. So he gave me an option, um, either to drive to Nairobi, uh, because they were unable to handle what they had seen. And I remember telling him, no, I cannot fly. I mean, I cannot drive to Nairobi. Mm. So then, um, luckily, um, we were able to get my mom on the phone. Mm. And um, then when she heard, I said, hold on, speak to the doctor. So when the doctor explained to her what happened, um, we were able to get um, flying doctors who came to pick me, an air ambulance pick me, mm. bring me over to Nairobi. Mm. And uh, when the doctors realized what happened, they, were said, they said, no, this is, this is serious. Mm. I had um, an aneurysm mm. and, uh, and a tumor. Mm. So I was rushed into theater, mm. and then they clipped the tumor. Mm. Sorry, they clipped the aneurysm, mm. but then they were unable to get to the tumor at that time. So at this time, it's 2017, we're in the middle of a heated... Um, run up to an election. Your father, of course, being who he is, is deep in campaigns. I imagine your mom is supporting him. Possibly so are you. How, how did your entire family cope with this emergency now that had, you know, that was at their doorstep? I think I have to commend my family because um, we had just lost my brother um, not too long before. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody came in very supportive. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my younger brother and younger sister took in the kids. Mm -hmm. um, my friend at the time, but also very supportive. My cousins as well, mm -hmm. and uncles and aunts. Everybody just came together. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Very, very grateful. Even my friends. Um, were also extremely supportive. Hmm. How, how um, conscious or aware were you of what was happening to you? Well, at that time, mm. um, 
I was not really conscious because uh, at at the point I even went into a coma. Mm. Yeah. So when the doctor said we were unable to treat it here in Kenya because mm. we did not have the equipment, um, I was flown to South Africa. Mm. Yeah. In a coma. Yes, and um, it was there that um, I came to um, mm. in South Africa. Mm. Still, still not aware of my surroundings, mm. um, and um, <laughs> that that was then. Mm. But looking at you now, um, it almost sounds like a movie. I remember when the. A little grainy video clip came out. I think it was a Sunday um, of you in a church, I think back home, um, standing and, you know, telling church elders, thank you for their prayers. You could now stand and you could partially um, see. So when I saw my children, it was very emotional for me, but I thank all of you because of your prayers. And I can almost remember the a literal sigh of relief in the country. How, how does that make you feel that so many people, people you don't know, were so invested in what was happening to you? I was really surprised. Um, I was really surprised. I take everything a step at a moment. Mm. Yeah. Once, one step at a time. Mm. And uh, I was in the home church. Um, been traveling. We go to that home church every Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, the larger family. Mm -hmm. So I was feeling very much at home. And I was when I was sick, my mom would show me the messages and would read for me messages from people mm -hmm. uh, and their well wishes and everything. So mm -hmm. I felt like they were all lifting me up. And um, mm -hmm. their spirits uh, encouraged me, and I f felt like I'm not in it alone. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, what is th what has the journey been like since? What is the, your daily routine um, in getting yourself, you know, back to health? Daily routine is, of course, you wake up. <laughs> I'm still a mother. Yeah. <laughs> Two girls, right? Two girls, yeah. yeah. My children still still need their mom. Mm. So they have actually been the s one of my strengths because mm -hmm. I know they need me. So I get up. I have to get them ready for school. Mm. I have to get myself ready. Then uh, we go. We have breakfast together. Mm. I'm still trying to build that, keep that unit strong. Right. Yeah. And then uh, they go off to school back. <laughs> then they would go off to school. Mm. And um, then, you know, after breakfast, then I start my physio mm. exercises now. Mm. Correct. Anything you you miss um, pre your illness? You've, you've come such a long way. But is there that one thing or a, a goal you have in mind? I, I can't wait to be able to do this again. I think what I miss is reading. Yeah. Yes, I used to love reading, 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 reading books, um, fictions, biographies. Mm. I used to love reading mm. um, books. You know, I remember going back to stories like Chinua Achebe's <laughs> books. You know, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I miss I miss reading. Mm. And when someone's reading to you, it's it's not the same. Mm. It's not the same. Mm. So that control of being able to read your own books. Mm. And that is why I'm doing the exercises mm. to build my um, strength so that now I can be able to sit down and just read all the books that I would like to read. Yeah. Beyond how the illness affected you, because you, I mean, you're obviously politically conscious, uh, uh, women-centered, involved in, um, in that before your illness. What did your own physical uh, temporary incapacitation reveal about our systems and uh, the options for people who have the kind of illness that you know you've had to endure 
Well, at that time, it was unfortunate that um, the country did not have the equipment mm -hmm. that uh, was needed for this delicate operation. Mm -hmm. And then also the training of doctors. Mm -hmm. um, there were not as many doctors who were trained with these intricate procedures. Mm -hmm. And uh, the healthcare system also was not as strong. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the saddest bit of it is that um, even if someone knew technically what needed to be done, they did not have the equipment um, in-house. Mm -hmm. So I think we would need to invest more in um, some of these procedures as a country, the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, at the time you fell ill, you were also um, a successful entrepreneur um, getting into politics. And many people were hopeful that you would be running, possibly in, in Kibra. Are you, do you feel strong enough again to even consider a return to politics? Well, it's still too early mm -hmm. <laughs> to talk about um, running for office right now. Mm -hmm. Right now, the country is going through a tough time with COVID, mm -hmm. and now is not the time for people to think about what seats I want, who I want to remove, who I want <laughs> to, put <in. laughs> yeah. to, to put in. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there's still uh, politics happening, but this is not the time for that. I think we need to be more more cognizant of the fact that many people don't have jobs mm -hmm. and um, many people are struggling to, to earn a living. Mm -hmm. And so this is not the moment to talk about seats mm -hmm. and who wants what and who should get what, mm -hmm. in my view. Yeah. And um, because you have worked with, with women, obviously the impact of COVID-19 has been um, severe and, and I think one of the shocking things has been to see an increase in you know gender and sexual based violence uh, coupled with that of course a lot of families are going through a lot of stress like you've rightly said people are losing their jobs uh, what are your thoughts in terms of the interventions that are needed to help young people who are out of work uh, women who are um, finding themselves in abusive situations and because of just the the lockdown nature of dealing with COVID-19 are not able to get to safety. It's unfortunate that um, this is happening in our country. Mm. Not just our country, it's actually pretty much all over the world. It's like our systems have been turned upside down. Mm. And I think it's this time where we need to come together mm. more than ever and support one another, you know, emotionally, physically, mm -hmm. and um, this is the time for mm -hmm. us to show who we are as Kenyans. Mm -hmm. We care for one another. We are there for one another. Mm -hmm. And um, we try and understand and listen to one another mm -hmm. and support each other. There is a picture um, of you that um, this is right after you recovered and um, the president and um, your father were at the U.S. They were in the U.S. at the U.S. prayer breakfast. And there you were at this incredible um, prayer breakfast uh, invited by none other than the U.S. president. And, um, of course, the two leaders were there to promote uh, BBI um, and the handshake and the spirit of reconciliation. But what grabbed many people's attention was you in the middle of the two. And some took it to mean as much as a kind of forecast of your future. Did people read a little bit too much into that picture? I think they did read <laughs> too much into that picture. I mean, for me, it was an honor to be at this, um, this event. You know, the prayer breakfast is about bringing people together. And um, 
I was honored to be there, uh, to be with these two great men who everybody knows at one point who were on opposite sides. Mm -hmm. And they have now come together mm -hmm. at a prayer breakfast in America mm -hmm. and um, saying, look, we can embrace the person with whom mm -hmm. we differed with politically for the benefit of the country. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the U.S. right now um, needs to appreciate that message more than ever. Mm. It's a very divided nation. Mm. Whereas us in Kenya, we are trying to move forward and uh, see how we can work together. Mm. And I think anything that brings people together for the benefit of our country should be welcomed. Mm. Should be welcomed. Mm. And I commend, I commend both men mm. for uh, coming together and putting all differences aside. Your father has since told um, the story, uh, um, I think much to the amusement of, of, of Kenyans, you know, of that long conversation. I know President Kenyatta has remarked that, you know, <laughs> they spent, I think, about an hour just not talking, you know, just looking at each other before they really got talking. Uh, what was it like from the family perspective? Were you read in? Did you know what was going on? Were you surprised as the rest of the nation? <laughs> I remember um, myself personally, when my late brother passed on, mm -hmm. I stood up and I asked the two men to come together. Mm -hmm. I said, for the sake of the country, mm -hmm. come together. Mm -hmm. And um, so in other words, I, I think I'm happy because finally they listened to <laughs> what I told them years ago, right. come together for the sake of the country. And mm -hmm. then I think once they came together, the country at least for me, I felt had a sigh of, of, of relief, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Did you verbally tell them you two need to talk to each other or was it? It's there. <laughs> <laughs> and the speech that I gave at the funeral, I said it. At the it. funeral, right. At the funeral, right, right. At the funeral, I said right. it. I said, come together. Hmm. And I said, um, you're holding the instruments of power now, hmm. but tomorrow you might have to give to someone else come together for the sake of the country. Please, come have dialogue without any ultimatums. And to the leadership of the country right now, yesterday you did not own the instruments of power. Tomorrow you will have to give those instruments to somebody else. What will be your legacy? Kindly I ask, Humble yourselves and come for dialogue. What do you think um, is the the role of you know the the president and uh, Right Honourable Raila, your father, are both such institutions um, in in their own right. Um, to what extent is family? Um, do you think an important? voice in driving what they do politically as actors. Is it, and from your own experience, is this something that you actually do lean in on and say, hey, on this, Dad, I don't think you're right, or you're right. Or do you take more of a, a back seat? Is there that separation for you? That's politics, this is family. Well, yes, there's politics and there's family, but um, you cannot run away from the fact that you were born <laughs> in, into this family. And um, mm -hmm. I do talk to many people who say that, no, I'm not interested in politics. But then the truth of the matter is politics runs our, our countries because mm -hmm. it's the politicians who pass the bills mm -hmm. that we have to live by. Mm -hmm. So when you say you do not uh, participate, mm -hmm then you're letting someone else make decisions for you right. without your input. Mm. So I, um, in that regard, I also like to voice my opinion sometimes. And I say, look, yes. this is what I think. Yes. This is what I don't think. And I'm very happy that in our home, mm. growing up, it's welcomed. Even my little daughters. They <laughs> give have a political opinion? <laughs> they, they, give, they give their own uh, opinion on what they think and they know who the characters are right. and they ask questions. So um, mm -hmm. I'm lucky in our home, there's no voice that is bigger than the other. Mm -hmm. 
mm. everyone's voice matters mm. and uh, and I really appreciate being given that opportunity mm. and that is now what also what I try to to allow you see by me having my own view does not stop you uh, does not stop you from having your own so me having mine and you having yours it's, it's okay there's enough room for all of us right. and so that's that's the home that I grew up in. Wow. A, a democratic home. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could say the, the democratic in the home. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's easy for people to believe, uh, because you're also uh, politically uh, active, that your politics is the same as your father's, that you are of one mind on all issues. It, it, do you see it that way? Do you have some very significant departures in philosophy or in, or in, or in practice? Well, I would say we, um, starting from my grandfather, mm -hmm. who sacrificed, um, even went to jail for us Kenyans to be able to have self-rule, mm -hmm. and from my father also who went to detention. Uh, I mean, growing up as a child, <laughs> there's some points of my life where he was not there because in detention, mm -hmm. fighting for this country. Um, so I grew up in a home where we're conscious of what it is to be patriots and to love your country. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yes, guilty as charged, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, right. I love my country and mm -hmm. I also love mm -hmm. Africa mm -hmm. and I love the continent and I love a world where people are allowed to live and walk freely. Liberal, liberal, I guess is mm -hmm. the term mm -hmm. we would use. Mm -hmm. So your politics are indeed similar? In that sense, yes, it's similar. Mm -hmm. But I guess, um, you know, we're different generations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're different generations. Mm -hmm. And then we have different people who have influenced us. Mm -hmm. So in a way, maybe the way we share our message might be different. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we want for us all to prosper, mm -hmm. we would say we are similar. There is a popular narrative right now that, um, and I know you've said it isn't the time to, to talk politics, uh, but again, you have equally said that, that politics is running our lives. And so um, there's a popular narrative right now that uh, the next election will be between, you know, it will be a contest between Hustler versus Dynasty. I, I think I don't need to tell you <laughs> who's being labeled Dynasty. In the, uh, of course, um, those who are against um, the handshake or who feel opposed to it, they say sometimes the Odingas are the dynasties or the Kenyatas are the dynasties or what have you. Um, so let's start with, do you consider yourself as part of a political dynasty? What do you think of that term? Well, um, it's unfortunate that that... Um, has been found its way into our politics, right? Mm -hmm. Into the conversation of the of, of our of our nation. Mm -hmm. Because really you should judge someone by their character and what they are offering to you and what they are going to do to bring you it should be about your policies. Mm -hmm. It should be about what you're going to provide to your country, not this new narrative of mm -hmm. dynasties and and whatever it is that uh, is is mm -hmm. being peddled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are a country where we should focus on policies mm -hmm. and what's the policies that we're going to do to uplift one another mm -hmm. and give you an opportunity to be so who you can be. What do you think um, about those who say that families like yours or any of the others that I have mentioned, for instance, um, have been in power so long have so shaped, as you have said, um, the way politicians can shape the country um, and kind of make your family the poster child for what's wrong in Kenya? Well, you see, the fact that we are here, we are Kenyans, <laughs> just like other Kenyans are Kenyans. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's politics is about co it's a contest. Mm -hmm. So you sell your your policies, mm 
mm. that the next person sell their palaces, mm. and let the Kenyan people decide mm. um, where they want to go. We do not force uh, ourselves on people, and people choose. Mm. That is why we are in a democratic country. Mm. So it does not stop others from joining the contest. Mm. Mm. Um, coming from, again, a, a, a prominent political family, you could do well, we imagine you could do absolutely anything with great success. But you chose um, politics, and it sounds like you still have an inkling towards it, if I'm hearing you correctly, am I? Um, but when you watch the news <laughs> every day, right. um, people are speaking, and um, that in itself is politics. Like just the other day, we had the budget being read. Mm -hmm. um, that again affects the food that I'm going to eat in my house every day mm -hmm. and um, whether I'm happy or not happy, then I have a representative who should voice my, mm. my, my thoughts and my feelings. So mm. um, how do you run away from that? <laughs> Does that mean that I do not want to participate in, in being able to take care of my family? Mm. So that's the question that you need to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, that is my understanding of, of politics and my understanding of my role as a citizen. Mm -hmm. Correct. I, I ask this because um, why would you, even having heard what you said, why would you, there are many ways arguably you could make a difference. I think you already were doing it very much um, as an entrepreneur. Um, why politics when it has it is so unforgiving, especially for women in Kenya? What is it that makes you feel that this is a field where I, I still do need to make a contribution beyond that of your immediate family or what would be required of a good citizen? Well, you could say many jobs are unforgiving for women. I say even you as a journalist. Oh, this is completely <laughs> unforgiven. You're never <laughs> forgiven. <laughs> yes. We've seen many jobs where, uh, you know, journalists are being attacked. Mm. We've seen uh, jobs where nurses mm. are being attacked. We've even seen police officers, <laughs> female officers being attacked. Mm. So I think um, you can choose to sit at home yeah. and say, oh, I'll never work again because Mm. A job is unforgiving for women. Mm. And, but then, again, you just say, look, I have to get out. I have to go. I have to work. Mm. Whether I'm a policewoman, mm. whether I'm a nurse, whether I'm a journalist, whether I'm a politician. Mm. So I think it's your personal drive mm. and what you want to contribute. And therefore, I was thinking about maybe looking at the policies that we have in our country mm. and how we can enrich the policies that we have mm. so that everyone can prosper. Mm. Um, right now, um, in fact, this, this particular week, uh, women in, in politics have been uh, in the spotlight, um, particularly in the matter of the impeachment of Governor Anwe Goro. And, and I don't want to talk about the, the impeachment itself, but rather the statement from women leaders um, who have, in essence, claimed that she was being victimized because she is a woman. And that defense of her was met with public um, furore and uproar. Uh, is, is this a, a gender issue for you? Is it an accountability and integrity issue for you? And should, given the very few numbers of women who we have standing up and actually participating in politics, which can be as brutal as we have just talked about, should women leaders be defended at all costs? Well, you see, um, we have male uh, governors as well who you've seen also, they have been accused of, of uh, similar, mm -hmm. um, or almost similar um, charges. Mm -hmm. But you've never had men coming up and saying that they're standing up for, for their male counterparts. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have uh, mechanisms in this country mm -hmm. and we should allow the mechanisms to take, take mm -hmm. their, do their job and um, from there, we will now be able to, 
to understand the roles better. Mm. Um, you've talked about the mechanisms. So, so you would agree that um, women leaders should follow due process just like men? I think so because they've taken the same jobs <laughs> that <laughs> men have taken. Right. I mean, if someone was driving you in a car mm. and um, you did not were not happy with the way the lady driver was driving, mm. would you say, oh, I'd like a male driver because of ABCDFG? I mean, if you're mm. sitting in a car and mm. it's a public vehicle, mm. you want to be driven correctly. Right. So I think... Um, whether it's a man or woman driving. Yeah, let us let let them drive the car the way it should be driven. Mm -hmm. And if people are not happy for whatever reason, mm -hmm. let us see mm -hmm. um, how we can help improve. Mm -hmm. One of the criticisms I've heard this week regarding um, how women leaders have come out in support of one of their own who's been accused of impropriety is that when you support this one, it takes away um, from the real critical issues that other women are facing and that it weakens the movement. Some have gone as far as arguing there's some kind of political bias, you know, when somebody who sounds politically correct is, um, you know, being held to account, then you have, you know, state resources going out to support them, yet there are other women who've been in similar positions. Uh, what's your view? Because there seems to be still this underlying um, uncertainty in the women's movement, whether it is one and whether it is for everyone or it's just for the political elite? Um, you know, my mom, growing up in the home, you know, um, was a member of the League of Kenya Women Voters. Mm. And growing up, I saw the conversations that they had at that time about getting women um, leaders into positions of power and how they will be able to make a difference. And I see even today we have the two-thirds majority rule, which parliament has been able to, to and political parties have been able to push. Mm -hmm. So um, which conversation are we going to have? Mm -hmm. And um, you see we also have other governors, for example, we have Charity Ngidu, mm -hmm. um, whom I remember from the time I was much, much, much younger. Yeah. And, um, and I know she's talked about this issue. Mm -hmm. However, I think when we uh, try and focus in too much on the fact that she's a, li a, a woman mm -hmm. and not listen to what the accusation is about, then mm -hmm. we, lose, we lose the 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 forest mm. yeah mm. focusing on the tree wow you lose the forest focusing on the tree yes yeah, so let's let uh, the procedure go forward and let us see whether the evidence brought forward is mm. is, is 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 correct or real evidence mm. then let us make our decision then mm. yeah that's powerful i i had to like oh wait a minute I've been focusing on some trees. <laughs> <laughs> it was like an aha moment. Because the forest is the rest of us women. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. The forest is the, the other w women out here who want us to work together. Mm. Yes, and so we, we need to think about the also other women leaders um, mm. and also the others who want to be mentored. Mm. And so we need to think about how, and also young men uh, <laughs> who, who need to be mentored mm. and who look up to women leaders and mm. both male leaders. So let us try and give good examples and let us also try and make our decisions based on evidence mm. that we see. Wow. Um, as we conclude, um, and, and because I, I cover politics, I, I just have to ask, Rosemary. I know you're on a journey to health and you've come a long way. But do you, and you've said in this program that, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, that you are focusing on policy right now. But in your heart somewhere, does something ring for elective politics? Is, is 2022 too soon? 
I think it's too soon to talk about 2022. Mm. And let um, us wait and we'll see. Because as long as I am able to support my country and countrymen and countrywomen, mm. I'm happy. Mm. So it does not have to necessarily be a political uh, space. But if it is, then so be it. <laughs> Let the people decide. <laughs> <laughs> For me, that's a lovely way to end. Uh, what is your parting shot? I'll end with where I started. We are in a situation right now where we're dealing with COVID-19 mm -hmm. and uh, the economy is really struggling. Mm -hmm. So um, in the words of Robert Nesta Marley, my fellow Kenyans, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is going to be all right. Mm -hmm. um, let us come together and let us try and hold each other's hands because everything is going to be all right. Might I just add, she ended on a note of reggae. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary. We wish you well and good health. Asante.